Oh, it was cosy and warm when I woke up this morning. I thought, no, nope, I've got to do it. So I went out and I ran up this bloody steep hill about 10 times till I felt like throwing up. And I thought, now I've uh, presumably approximated how you guys felt last night when you finally submitted. So let me tell you, let me tell you um, what I saw this morning, though, because I saw something really interesting. I thought, oh, I have to tell them this in the lecture. Oh, and uh, look, uh, before I tell you that, do you want to talk about Cosy? Yeah. Did you say Cosy or Cosy? Cosy. 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 Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. In week 10, which is next week, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, New College is doing a performance of the play Cosy. Uh, it's a play about some people in a mental institution trying to perform one of Shakespeare's plays, which also has the same name apparently. Cosy Venturi. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And there's more about it than I do. That's $8 for students, which is all of you. And for parents and stuff, it's $12. Um, I better write the contact number. Yes, yes, do that. And I'll leave that up the whole lecture. Let me say, I've seen a couple of the new college productions, and they're fantastic. It's a real highlight of the year for me to go and see it. So don't let me forget to buy a ticket from you. Yeah. Because, uh, We've also yeah, got yeah. flyers, and as an added bonus, there's a Sudoku on the back of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> And if you get the Sudoku out, it's free admission. <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a, it's a free Coke at interval. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and a bar. Look, I went to the... Um, I missed the new college one last year, I think. I think I might have been sick, because it's this time of year, isn't it, where we're all going to get sick. Let me just say something about getting sick. You're all working hard now, and you're all stressed, and it's cold. This is a bad conjunction of things, so you're all likely to get sick. And getting sick... Look, there's coffin, there's dessert, there's germs in the room already. Getting sick right now is not really good. It's actually better to work less hard and not get sick than to work hard and get sick. So do keep your eye on your health. Uh, and the best thing you can get, though this will sound like a joke saying it now, is sleep. But you try and get sleep. But don't sleep when this is on because it's going to be fantastic if it's as good as the previous ones I've seen. Take a break and, and have a rest from all the stress and go and see this. I saw the film years ago. A friend of mine was the casting person for the film. Uh, and it's a fantastic film, and it's, it's a fantastic play, and Louis Nara is really good, and everything's good. Okay. So as I was saying, back on the important C topic that we're covering at the moment, when I was out doing my jog this morning, I saw a personal trainer, and he was making these old people run across a bridge. <laughs> and they were running across and going down, then running back, and, and he was ticking them or timing them or something. They were working hard and they were old and they were running and it was a hot, bloody cold morning. And they were working very hard. And I heard him say as they were running up, he was saying to one old person, good, good, you're halfway there, you're doing well. And I, and I sort of jogged by in my ambling, non-old person way, thinking, ah, oh, I might be unfit, but at least I'm not old. Uh, I mean, from your point of view, I am, but yeah. <laughs> it's all relative. And, um, and I thought, gee, you know, that's really the same as uh, his job is sort of the same as my job in a way because he, I imagine he had some people there who are old who are already quite fit and some people there who are old and completely unfit. And he's somehow got to train them all. It's in a group. So that they're, they're, what do you got to do as a trainer? What's the objective? What, what, in an activity, what's he trying to get them to do? What's that? Get them... Get them better. Yeah, but what does he? That's his long-term goal to increase everyone's health. What's his objective in a training session? Exhaust them, stretch them, push them to their limit. But some of them are already quite fit, and some aren't. So how's he going to do that? Might I suggest with old people? There's only a certain range. They weren't that old. They weren't. Yeah, they weren't that old. I mean, he did have the heart attack problem too, probably. But so I thought, oh, it's a bit like this course, because in this course. Yeah, we want you all to get better and to be better programmers. And on entry, some of you can already program and some can't. And really, you're only going to get better by getting this exhausted thing. By, not exhausted, but by being pushed to the limit and then slightly a bit more. That's how we improve. So, but some of you, it doesn't take much to get you to the limit because you haven't programmed. And some of you take a lot. So I hope in this assignment, everyone has somehow pushed themselves to the limit. And if you haven't, you've already had one submission date. We're a third of the way through it. It's like I'm on the bridge saying, come on, you're a third of the way through. Well done. Good. Because you're a third of the way through, but don't, don't stop and rest. Um, hopefully in the first third you've all stretched yourself. So if you could already program and you found it easy, hopefully you've thought a lot about ADTs and interfaces and shoots and abstractions and things like that. 
If you couldn't program at all, then hopefully you just really tried to master pointers and arrays. And you but hopefully whoever you are, no matter what you already knew, you worked really hard and you strained yourself in some way over this last week. Now, I, on my way back, I passed by the end of the bridge and they were all standing around looking red and like this and he was saying, speaking to them. And I thought, shh, shh, guys, shush, this is really important see, You can't miss this. It's bound to be in the exam. In the, you walk into the exam room and you go, oh, he wasn't joking. And there would just be a whole lot of old people there. <laughs> and you'll all be assigned a small group. Yeah. So uh, how would he be, when he looked at them all at the end, who was he the most happy with, do you think? Yes. The ones that looked most exhausted. Does he really care that some of them weren't able to run across the bridge ten times? He couldn't give a damn. You know, he's saying to them, you've got to do it ten times. He's doing that to push them. But what he wants to see is someone's pushing themselves to the limit and they keep trying. Now, maybe some really old person, they couldn't do it ten times, but they did it five and they're exhausted and they kept going for that fifth leg and they wanted to stop and they didn't and they kept going. And probably there's someone who's really fit who just sort of walked across the bridge ten times and thought, oh, I might do it again. No, I'll take a rest now. And they're sitting there looking completely relaxed. Is he pleased at the person that could walk across the bridge or is he pleased at the person that completely buggered themselves? Buggered themselves. And if someone completely buggered themselves on that activity and they couldn't do all 10 times across the bridge and he says, now our next thing is we're going to jog around the park, what would you think if an old person said, I wasn't able to go across the bridge 10 times, I failed, I'm just giving up, I'm not going to go for a jog around the park? If you're him, what would you say? Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> no, you'd say, don't be insane. You did this fantastic thing. It doesn't matter if you failed on the first bit. That doesn't affect the next bit. Just keep going. Don't give up. So, this is exactly what I'm going to say for the assignment. I don't actually care if you got it working or not. I know it sounds heartless to say that. I care that you busted a gut trying to get it working and that you've learned pointers or you've learned abstraction or you've learned style or you've learned something new and you push yourself in some way. Now, if you didn't get it and you missed a deadline or something's not working or something, if you give up now, that's just absolutely insane. It'd be as insane as an old person not doing the first part of the exercise regime quite exactly up to what they wanted and giving up and not doing any more. You've got to just pick yourself up and now do the next thing. And you've got to push yourself. And at the end of the three weeks, I want to see you bending over in red and vomiting on the ground. <laughs> and that's how I know. In fact, in the lecture feedback form at the end of the course, if you just hand in a little bag of vomit, when I say, what did you think of the lectures? Yeah, that will make me happy. <laughs> OK. Now. The dilemma with task one is that we have these deadlines. Can I just explain the deadline system? There's two parts to the group work. The big part is getting the interface in. That was due by 5 p.m. Friday or something like that. You can actually change the interface after the due time, whenever that was. The interface is marked out of, does anyone remember? Two, two or three. I think it's two. If the interface you hand in is perfect, you're going to get two out of two. If the interface isn't quite right, you won't get full marks, but who cares about the marks? What else is the consequence of the interface not being quite right? Yeah, it makes everything really hard. Either it makes it impossible or really hard. Now, I don't... Oh, you're just showing off now. I'm very impressed. Or is that like some sort of burglary? <laughs> no. Hey, I'm, can you actually do that? No. I'm learning. You're learning. I'm so impressed. Well done. That's awesome. What's your name? Wewa. Wewa. We, how do you spell that? W-E-I-H-U-A. W-E-I? H-U-A. Oh, that, that's a double part name sort of thing. Yeah. Wewa. Okay. Well done. That's awesome, Wewa. Okay. Guys, if anyone learns, if you learn how to do that, you don't have to hand in the project. <laughs> you can just do that instead of the project. I, I'd say that's equivalent. Taking on a challenge and mastering is what we want you to do. Now, if the interface doesn't work, then we've got... Um, it's actually a pain for you. It's really difficult. So we've allowed you to modify the interface. You can modify the interface, as you know, during stage two and stage three. But if you modify the interface, every time you modify it, the maximum mark it's out of halves. So if you modify it after the due date once, it's marked out of one. If you modify it after the due date twice, it's marked out of a half. If you modify it eight times after the due date... <laughs> okay. But, you know, really, who cares? that's losing a mark or two, 
versus having an interface that works. So you can keep working on it, but if you want to modify the interface, you need to get every single person in the chute to agree to the change. And in practice, unless you've got a really stuffed up interface, you're not going to be able to get that to work. So you're probably stuck with what you got. But if you can get every single person in the chute to agree, and don't put pressure on them, because no one has to agree, and if you force someone to agree, that's no good, I'm going to step in and not agree. Everyone has to voluntarily want to change it. But if you get a unanimous agreement from everyone in the chute to change the interface, you can. Then the second bit is you have to hand in your implementation. And your implementation was a play of you and a test play of you and a ref. Right, now the ref's finished. That's all done. But play of you and test play of you, you can keep on handing in new versions. What's play of you out of? Does anyone remember? Three. Three. What's test play of you out of? Three. Three, okay. So you are welcome to hand in new ones, but if you hand in a new one after now, what happens? The maximum mark is halved, so it's then marked out of one and a half. Does that make sense? You can hand in new ones if you want, and if it's broken, you should, because zero out of three is useless. You might as well get full marks and get it out of one and a half. So you're welcome to keep working on it in your group and handing in new versions, that's fine, but it will reduce your total mark. Or you can leave it exactly as it is if everything's perfect. Now, I would be really surprised if anyone has a perfect anything at the moment. Okay, that's just life. No one's going to have perfect things. So I'm expecting, to tell the truth, that this will be too difficult to change and no one will and you'll just be angry that you've got a bad interface and you will vow never to do that again and I will be happy. And I'm expecting that these are, everyone's going to resubmit these and everyone's just going to get a marked out of half. That no one's actually going to have decent ones. But if you've got a decent one, then leave them like they are. So that's what I'm expecting. Now someone hands it in 23 seconds late. And they'd already handed in previous versions. They just sort of kept going right up to the edge. And I was just, I was, this morning I was meeting a tutor and I was talking with him and I was saying, it's weird. It's like, you know, I could understand it for the task one, but they've had like two tasks and submissions now already and we've said over and over again, don't change things at last minute. Da, da, da. Isn't it weird? And I just knew that someone would hand it in late. And we just looked at each other and laughed and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, anyway, if you handed it in late and you're 23 seconds late or whatever, and you've previously been handing in other versions up until the last minute, well then, never do it again, but we'll delete that last version and you can go with the second last version you went in. Now there's someone that's even more, has an even more awful situation than that. Someone didn't hand in any previous versions and handed their one and only version in 11 seconds late. Now, who was that? Wave at me. Where are you? If that person is here and comes down and sings a song publicly apologizing, <laughs> we will grant them an 11 second extension. As long as this song that they will improvise includes lines to the effect that they promise they'll never do it again. If that person's not here, That was a 23 second submission. Yeah. So whoever handed it in late and they need it actually counted as a late submission. They don't want it deleted, they want it counted. Is that person here? Okay. Oh, well, that, that completely removes that problem. Okay. Um, uh, someone, if you're in the group of that person, encourage them to come to the next lecture. And, and we will let you go with that extension if you sing the song. But no more extensions, okay? From now on, actually. Boom. <laughs> we want blood, yeah. <laughs> Release the lions. Release the hounds. Okay, um, all right, so I think that's all the chit chat. Let's jump into the lecture. Do, 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 do. Yeah, ask a question while I'm doing it. When's player.seed you? Ah, well, that's interesting. We will start competitions soon. What day do we... I think we start the competitions maybe on Friday? So get a player.c in before Friday and it'll be in the competitions. I'm not sure. The cut-off time that night. If, if you need to know exactly what time it is, you're asking the wrong question. Yeah, get it in much earlier than the last possible second. Yeah, I... Phase one ends Friday. Phase one is this time when nothing's due and everything's rosy and we just sing and laugh. 
And then phase three, it's back to the time when things are due and marks are being handed out. But phase three is not like a cut-off deadline like it was for phase one. In phase three, we run a comp every night, or every night we can, unless we have software problems. And phase three lasts for maybe seven or eight or nine nights. And five, so we'll run, if it all goes well, seven or eight or nine comps. Or if there are problems, maybe five or six comps. And we will pick five of those comps to be for marks. And the first one won't be. So get it in for the first one and you just get a practice. And then we'll pick some other ones to be for marks. And we'll probably know in advance which ones they are. Uh, except if we get to the end and we haven't been able to qu run quite enough because of technical problems, some of the earlier ones that we thought might not have been for marks, we will retrospectively count for marks. So get, treat every night as though it's for marks and get something in every night. Once it's in, you can leave it in and it'll just keep competing. And you'll see the runs each night and you'll see what's going on and you'll think, oh, I need to improve my player. I did a dumb thing last night and you'll just tweak it a bit. I'm assuming that phase three is going to be the relaxed time because you're just going to have a player in already and you're just going to be tweaking it a little bit. And I'm assuming this phase two now is a busy time where you're putting all your brains into your player. Are there any more questions about that? Yeah. No, if you stuffed up the referee, it's just going to be some marks. It won't affect you at all. We won't use your referee. We will pick one referee from the whole course that we think is the best referee in the course, and that will be the referee we use. Yeah. Yes? You will see a log of the competition every night. You'll be able to see it play by play, blow by blow. You'll be able to work out who you were playing with and what they did and what you did, and you'll be able to see the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Say that again? Oh yeah, your player.c, shh, 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 the mechanics of it are, inside there's a whole lot of different tutorial groups. Let me draw circles for tutorial groups. So this is Glenn's Thursday Tute. In Glenn's Thursday Tute, they picked an interface. Every person in Glenn's Tute writes a program that uses that interface. On the other side of that interface has to be a player view. We will randomly give you either your own player view or one of the other player views from your tute or an evil player view that Glenn has written. <laughs> we will randomly try and give it to you. So we'll say, all righty, your player's up for playing. You're from Glenn's Thursday tute. I'll spin the wheel and pick a random, possibly evil player view. Or possibly they're all evil if they're all broken. And we'll pull it out and we'll run it with yours. But first, before we plug it into yours, we'll think, oh, hang on, before I plug it in, I better check it's all right, and I'll get your test player view. And your test player view will test it. And if your test player view reckons it's good, ah, you get it. <laughs> and it runs with your test player view. And it, so <laughs> if you've got good tests, your player is completely protected, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll deal with that when that happens. Yeah, yeah. If it runs too long, then you get disqualified. Oh, yeah. We'll have to work that out. Yes, up the back. Oh, yeah, 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 but don't forget how testing works. You've got a tester and a player view. And your tester probes the player view and makes a decision, and the decision is thumbs up. <laughs> or thumbs down. <laughs> or <laughs> Australia or New Zealand. Now, if your player view says our player is broken, then you each get a spot. You know about the black spot? What happens if you get the black spot? Pirates come and kill you. So you each get given the black spot. So your tester fails your ADT. So you and you each get a black spot. Now you negotiate between yourselves saying, actually, I think your test was wrong, my dear sir. Actually, I think your player was wrong, my dear sir. And then you have pistols to sort it out. <laughs> and at one point, one of you says, oh, actually, it was my mistake. And they 
confess to the spot and the other spot magically disappears. <laughs> or you can't decide it between yourselves and you go to arbitration. And arbitration is you go to your tutor and say, hey, can you tell us who was right and who was wrong? The tutor works out who was right and who was wrong and the wrong person gets two spots or two spots and the right person gets none. Now, it should never go to arbitration because it's very clear whether it's right or wrong. If someone's testing something, they're either testing something that's illegal or not legal. So they say, your testing function says, I play this card, I play that card, I play that card, and then I ask some question. I don't know how many sevens have been played. And your ADT says, there are three sevens played so far. Either it's right or it's wrong. You know, your ADT functions are easier to test. There's no dispute about it. If you return six and there's three left, then your ADT is wrong. And if he returns three and there are three and you say that's wrong, your test is wrong. So... Either your tester or your ADT will accumulate spots whenever it finds a problem. So you want your test to be right. You don't want to fail things that are correct. You do want to fail Glenn's evil program that he's put in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But essentially your test is like the gatekeeper. It's just protecting your code. We want it to have your interests aligned with ours. There's no point saying to people, write tests, write tests, write tests. I say it and everyone goes, oh, man, I couldn't be bothered to write tests. Yeah, I guess it's a good idea, but, you know, in the real world, no one writes tests. Instead of me trying to persuade you you should write tests and force you to write tests and show you funny movies about writing tests to brainwash you into writing tests, instead, I give you a situation where if you write tests, it's good. And if you don't write tests, you die a painful death. <laughs> now you're thinking, oh, hang on, tests are quite good. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yeah. So does that answer every single question that there was? Yes, it does, except those three. Yep, yeah, Robert. No, we didn't tell you it was going to be done like that. I did tell you. Oh, I leaked it, did I? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry for wasting your time saying it twice. Um, yes? What happens if, you, um, if your test fails theirs, and then whose player view do you use for that night? Oh, well, you, you keep finding, going through player views to one passes your test. Okay. Uh, now, unless you're in the bizarre situation that your own player view passes your own test, we'll find one that it passes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can't find one, then you can't play. Yes? <laughs> So if your own play of you fails your own test, what are you thinking? <laughs> yes? If your player is fine and you don't have to modify it, leave it there the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there was another question? All done. Okay. All done, all done, all done. All done. Question? So every night the competition runs and every night you find out. Shh. Oh, for the phase you've just done, in your tutes this week, your tutor will show you how your play of you went against everyone else's unit tests. Yeah, in your tute this week, you'll see that. Yes. Shh, shh, shh. be quiet, because these are all really good questions. Your test play of you won't work on the uni computers. So you've got to find out why, because there'll be something weird going on. Get everyone in your group to help you, because they've all got a vested interest in making it work. Yeah, yeah. Because if it doesn't work on the uni computers, your players, none of one in your group's players will be able to play any games. Because the test has to run and let someone in through the gate. Yeah, so get your group to help you. I mean, everyone in the group will want... You guys can work together in your groups to solve these problems. That's how you should do it. Yes? Will the tutors look for things like excessive memory leaks? Cause yeah, we're looking for memory leaks. Yes. That could crash our yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So if you've got a, yeah, we're not expecting you to test for things you can't test for. We're just expecting you to test for correctness. You can't test for how long something takes. You can't test for how much memory it uses. But we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, I don't want to see any memory leaks. And look, some people are asking weird questions like, can they do things like, they wanted an array of variable length and they wondered if they could malloc some memory for it. Because if they allocated a fixed amount of memory, they'd be wasting a bit of space at the end. So they wanted to malloc exactly the right amount of memory. Do this very elaborate way using malloc and point of addition and all sorts of crazy stuff to achieve this saving of presumably 100 bytes or something on your gigabyte memory computer. And to which, whoever, if you're that person or in that person's group, let me just say, if you make a million of these, then yeah, it's worth saving 100 bytes. And it's worth doing everything you can to save memory. But if you only make one or two of these, then uh, what, whatever you do, don't use malloc. Because malloc is like, um, it's, like, uh, it's like if you were my baby and I said, here, play with this razor blade. <laughs> you know, quite possibly everything's going to be our good. And quite possibly you'll end up with a really neat haircut. 
all going well, but there's also the downside. If something goes wrong, it could be terrible. With malloc, it's, you're just opening the door to all sorts of things going wrong. Now, if you malloc memory, then you better free it. Because if you've malloc some memory, you've set some memory aside on the heap. And if your function is going to terminate, you haven't... So this, whoever decided to do this, you now have an obligation when your arrays stop being used to free up the memory. Uh, you know, that's just an extra bit of work, and you could easily forget it. So, so I suggest avoid malloc and things that are going to use up memory because it's just dangerous. But uh, do it if you really want, but just know that you've given yourself a whole lot of work for possibly a gain that's not really important. If the gain's important, it's worth doing that amount of work. Um, but, you know, I hate complexity. If you can if always find an easier solution to something, I reckon do it unless it's really important to do the complex one. Now, all right, after all of that, Let's go to this. Oh, actually, I don't have to use my hand magic. While it's, that's happening, I'll log in here. Do think, keep thinking of good questions, they're good. But right now I'd like to go on with the lecture for a little bit. Maybe we could have some more questions after the break. But keep, keep thinking of them. Don't, don't stop them. And write them down so you don't forget to ask them. But let's, it'll just relax me a bit if I can progress through the lecture notes as well. Here we are. Oh. That's not good. Oh, here we are. Shh. Can you see that? Okay, I've talked about the personal chain, and now I want to talk about Josephus. Shh, shh. The Josephus problem is a famous problem. I believe it's based on a real story from, uh, like, Hebrew, like, probably from the Old Testament, or certainly from Hebrew history, of uh, some uh, uh, Jews that were locked in a cave. They were in a city that was... I don't know the true story... I did once, but I've got a bad memory, but some people were being attacked by some other people and they escaped somewhere into a big cave or something. And uh, it was probably the Romans uh, persecuting the Jews and they're in the cave. I'm making this up. It might not exactly have been that. And amongst all the people in the cave was like a guy called J Josephus. And, uh, or maybe the story's a bit different. And anyway, uh, something terrible happens. I think everyone uh, in the, the city gets killed, or the, it's just a terrible, terrible, terrible thing happens. And for some insane reason, anyway, I don't, can't remember the backstory, the people in the cave all decide to commit suicide. Maybe the Romans are coming and they're going to make them do terrible things, or who knows. But they all decide to commit suicide, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do. It's giving up. And Josephus thought, and I could be getting this story wrong, I hope I'm not offending anyone by getting it wrong. This is, it could be Masada, that's right. That's like, uh, is that right? The Masada fell and they hid in a cave or something? Um, no, 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 they were on the fort on top of the mountain. Yes. That's an awesome castle. Um, yep. It is. It's really incredible. And um, the Romans were coming, and there were a very small number of them and a very, very large number of Romans. And yes. they decided, rather than being taken alive and made into slaves or what God knows what else, they yes. killed themselves and decide how they died. They would kill themselves and decide how they died. So for whatever reason, they chose to commit suicide. And, but Josephus thought he didn't want to commit suicide, is my re re recollection of the story. So he suggested, hey, guys, let's play a game to work out who gets to kill who. Uh, um, so... Uh, why don't we all stand in a circle? Look, um, I don't really need to make it trivial. It happened thousands of years ago, but it was still a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, let's stand in a circle, and will, um, what we'll do is we'll pick some number, like, say, five. And we'll go around. Uh, um, maybe there's a... a, a um, we'll go around, and we'll count five round, and, and then when we pick the fifth person, the person on their left has to stab them to death or something horrible like that. So we go, like, one... Two, three, four, five. Ah, and he's gone. And then start, keep going. One, two, three, four, five. Now, jo Josephus was the one that said, let's play this game, and let's start with you, and let's use a number five. Okay? Because Josephus had worked it out. What did he work out? Yeah, he worked it out. He didn't really want to die. So um, I think he worked it out. So when it was down to two people, he was able to persuade the other people, maybe we should stop playing this game now. And I don't know what happened next, but presumably he survived if we all know the story. No? Someone might know. Anyway, let's pretend he did and it was a happy ending. So, 
Okay, so lots of people died, but uh, okay. So we kept going round and round. Do you get the idea? And now we go one, two, three, four. Interesting thing is we skip over this one. Five. A bit like passing in Blackadder and Baldrick. So one, two. Notice uh, after we delete someone, we start with the person immediately after them in the clockwise direction. One, two, three, four, five. It was a terrible story, wasn't it? Next time I lecture this, I'm going to give this story a happy story, back story. What, uh, and then this one after. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Where do I start after this one's gone? The top. One, two, three. Can you already work out who's going to live? Who's going to be left? Five. See if you can work it out. I made a mistake? That was four. He was going, hey, 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 Richard. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And who was the last one left? One, two, three, four, five. Is that right? If I got it right, the Josephus problem with, this is our starting place, uh, with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, with an interval of five. So ten, five on Josephus yields a survivor at position number three, say, or two if we count from zero. Does that make sense? So it's very interesting and tricky to work out for a given ring size and a given number of people to skip over each time, who's going to be the last one left? And let's call that the Josephus problem. Now, years ago, I gave this problem in a C class and I was using it to demonstrate some programming. Or maybe it was even in Haskell. I think it was Haskell. Now, think about it. And I gave it as an interesting problem to the students and everyone tried to code it. And I noticed even the best students got it wrong. I was really intrigued by this. So I was about to talk about it the following year and give it as a, an example of a different thing when I noticed that there was a lecturer sitting up the back of the classroom, which there isn't this time. But, and I said, hey, whoever it was, let's not say their name, come down and during the break, can you code up a solution to Josephus so I can show it to the students after the break? Why did I ask them to do that? Because well, I was hoping they would... Yeah, to embarrass someone else. Okay. I was hoping they'd get it wrong because they were a really cool programmer. They were a much better programmer than me and they had like five minutes to code it and it looks pretty trivial and they got it wrong. They did get it wrong. And I thought, um, and that was great and very compelling to the students that how easy it is to get a problem wrong. Now, why did, why did I want to show that? Because I want to show you how you could code this so you wouldn't get it wrong. You could get it right, completely right, if you were just a diabolically clever hacky programmer and you were just very clever and you just got all, dot all your I's and crossed your T's and thought about it exactly right, in theory you could get it right. It's not impossible to get right, but my experience with people solving it is more or less invariably people get it wrong. So, how could you approach this problem in a fairly mindless way and get it right? Well, I'm going to suggest to you, yes, Robert. It's like a stack that loops on itself? Yeah, yeah. Look, I like the way you're thinking. Yeah, what were you going to say? Why not just have a list, right, of each of the people? Yes. Uh, you go to whichever one you start on, you just count down five, and then ten is ripped off, and go to the next one. Thank you very much. I've forgotten your name. I know I should know it. Richard. Richard. That's right. Uh, but really, we call you... Glenn. Glenn. That's right. <laughs> That's Richard. Um, yeah, look, Richard is a really clever guy. <laughs> Um, both of those guys, Richard and Robert, everyone who's answered that question, his name starts with R, said a perfect answer. Because for me, the way you answer this question is you don't think a lot about the algorithm. The algorithm is, seems simple enough, but it's got some subtle fence post conditions in it. Instead, what was the first thought that came into both their minds? They weren't actually talking about Josephus at all. What were they talking about? The data structure to use. That is the right way, I think, of approaching complex problems. When you've got a big complex problem, you want to break it into small problems and you want to divide the complexity up. And essentially, you've got this trade-off between your algorithm and your data structure. Usually, for a given problem of a given size complexity, you can move all the complexity into the algorithm and have very trivial data structures, or you can make the world's most elaborate data structure and have a trivial algorithm. Now, I think when we start programming, we're inclined not to use fancy data structures and move too much of the complexity into the algorithm. So my general advice is always try and push complexity the other way. Now, of course, you can go too far, but it doesn't seem to happen very often in first year that people do go too far the other way. 
A data structure has an advantage over an algorithm, I should say. I reckon it can handle complexity slightly better than an algorithm can. Because an algorithm is a temporal thing that involves a series of steps. And it's very hard to analyze a temporal thing. Because once a step's happened, it's gone, and the new step replaces it. And it, it's hard for us to understand sequences of things. So if I gave you a long sequence of instructions, it's much harder for you to understand than if I gave you, say, a physical end product that you could look at and count and go forward. I, some, I think somehow a lot of instructions, especially where they modify the results of previous instructions, it's relying too much on your memory to understand it. It's a bit hard to fit in your head. Where something you can just see, that's easier. So I actually think a data structure is a bit like a solidified algorithm. It's like algorithms solidified in time. Here's the time being all fluid. You solidify the time in a data structure. And I, I sort of think, for me at least, that makes it easier to understand problems. So I really do like moving complexity this way. So yeah, let's solve this problem with a data structure. So the first question we should ask, which I'm absolutely delighted to see two people have already asked that question, is what's the appropriate data structure to use? Now we're going to use our top-down ADT-based method of solving this question. Instead of picking a data structure and zooming right in on it, we're going to say, what are the operations I'm going to need on my data structure? Suppose we've got a data structure which we'll call a ring of people. We'll just call it a ring, say. It's going to represent the physical structure, like I drew it on the board. It made sense when you saw it on the board because you see the physical thing. So we've got a ring. What are the operations we might want on the ring? <laughs> yeah, but let's, let's just think Richard's really regretting picking the whole Josephus thing. Let's, let's think of a different backstory. Um, it's past the parcel. Thank you very much. It's past the parcel, and everyone gets a present. <laughs> and the person operating the tape recorder lets it go for five people each time. And once you've got a present, you have to drop out so no one can get two presents. And the birthday girl at the end gets what's inside, which is a slightly larger present, say. So we need to work out where to seat the birthday girl. Thank you. Whoever suggested past the parcel is brilliant. So this is a ring of children. Yes. Okay, you need to know how, the size of the ring. How many are left in the ring? Yes. What else do you need to know? Who's next? Who's next? So we need to know the, um, we're going to have a pointer pointing at them. We need to know the, like, the, the current dude in the ring. Who is the current dude in the ring? What else do we need? <laughs> need to be able to pop someone out of the ring. Give someone a present. <laughs> Remove. Oh, let's write in the type signatures as we, as we go. Size is going to take in a ring. Yep, it's abstract. We don't know what a ring is, and it's going to return an int. Current is going to take in a ring, and it's going to return a child. <laughs> Remove is going to take a... Um... <laughs> What's that? What, what, what? It takes a ring and gives you a child. Oh, man. Uh, that's awesome. Well done. OK. Uh, remove. Oh, no. This is like divorce or something, I guess. Remove a ring. You get nothing. And you remove the current element from the ring. All right, what else do we need? Yes? What's that? No, no, remove just removes the current person from the ring. So, we, so, yeah, the child will be gone, but we don't get the child. It's just gone. They're just gone. To get the child, we can use current. I'm trying not to introduce redundancy in the thing. What else do we need? Ah, uh, thank you very much. We don't need make child. What do we need? Stop that. We need make ring. Thank you very much. That returns a ring. And presumably it's given some sort of list of children somehow. <laughs> yeah, what? Say that. We're going to. Yeah, advance. We need an operation in advance or something. Do we advance one or advance n? I'd be inclined to advance one because then we can use this ring for other things. So let's just have. Uh, we just have an operation called next. So. Yeah, yeah, you could have advance n. Yeah, I'm just trying to pick a primitive one. You could have advance n. There's nothing wrong with that. So next, ring, which is void. 
So we've got something to make a ring. Oh, well, it's the world of C, so we better have something to delete a ring. Yes? Should we have a, a back? Ah, good question. We might want to extend this later on to do more general things. So should we put more functions in now? What am I going to say to that? No, because, I mean, maybe later on we will need to add extra functions. But if it's an ADT, it's always painless to add functions. But it's difficult to pull them out. So the idea of extreme programming is we only put in exactly what we need to solve the problem now. And we don't try and foresee future things. Because once you start playing that game, things get very cumbersome and big really quickly. So our discipline's going to be, no, I'm only going to let myself put in things I really, really need right now. And I'll add things later on if I need them and refactor. So all we need is something to get rid of a ring, uh, which we'll call, say, Mount Doom. <laughs> and that you just give that a ring. <laughs> and now this is only because we've got C. OK, so now we're given these functions. I reckon anyone here can write something to solve the Josephus problem. And everyone here, modulo stupid mistakes, would get it right. Because now, the algorithms in terms of these primitive operations, which are all natural, which model the problem exactly as we gave it to you. And, it's very tr and your code, when you read it, that used these operations, would actually look exactly like my description of the problem. And you would not get it right. But if, I, if we didn't break it down in this way and split some of the complexity into the ring and some into the algorithm and just tried to write it, you could do it. But I bet you, the first time you ran your tests on it, you'd be out by one in at least one spot. It's just very subtle what's going on with the deletions and things. OK, um, so how would we implement this? I reckon you could use this to solve Josephus. How would we implement? What would a ring really look like? We didn't need to know that. It's abstract to create the interface. But now we've got the interface. What's a ring like? Yeah. You could say every member in the ring is sort of linked to the next one. You could say an array. Circular. Someone said a list before of stuff. A circular thing? A circular linked list, yeah. Now, all of those are completely fine. In fact, a lot of them are the same. Really, there's sort of two ways of doing it, or three ways. One is we could just have a chain of guys all connected to each other. And we'd probably get the last guy to connect back to the first guy. And we'd have some external pointer pointing to one of them. That would be the current guy. Now, you can see how current would go. The current operation would just find who it's pointing to. It would just dereference it with a star. And these would have to be, well, how could you have something that contained the name of a child and also a pointer? What would that, it contains two pieces of information, so it needs to be a struct. So we could have a type maybe called node that was a struct that contained a child, whatever that is. That could be abstract or it could be a string or whatever and a pointer to a node. Yep. And this would be just a pointer to a node. And you can see how we can set this up. This is very natural. Another way of doing it is some people would think maybe of just having a list like this. Often people, common in computer science is just to have a, link, a list like that. And the last guy terminates the list. And then you just have to keep track of when you got to the end restarting. But I think you'll agree this is nicer if the, it's actually a ring goes round and round. Doing it with an array is also fine. That doesn't involve pointers, so it's less likely to have an error in it. But what's the problem? There's one operation in this that's much easier to do than it would be in an array. What's the... Child. Yeah. <laughs> Removing... <laughs> you just be, you're just going to shout that out to every question, aren't you? you just think every time that could be a possible answer. To remove a child from the ring, in the ring, is very easy. We just get the pointer before it, and we get it to point to the one afterwards. And we'd better free this memory or do something with it, or we've now just wasted some memory. But it's not too hard. Whereas in the array here, can you see if we deleted someone, we'd have to shuffle everyone up. Or we could just write deleted in here, but then it makes the counting harder, because then we have to skip over deleted guys. And if it's a really big array to start with, like a million people, Towards the end, when nearly everyone's deleted, you're just wasting a lot of time, whereas these guys have a tiny little loop and they're doing So the array is a, um, it's always like possible to do things in arrays. And I mean, the only problem with the array is you need to know its maximum size, and this can sort of grow forever. Um, so the array is sort of neat, but I think the speed advantage of having it in a loop is probably greater than an array. Yes? Well, what is a loop in terms of C syntax? Well, let's write a loop and see what a loop would look like.
We, we, the loop is made of a number of links. Let's call each of the links a node. And a node is going to look like this. I'm going to draw a picture of it because I really like pictures. It's going to contain the name of a child, which will be, uh, say, a string. A string. And it's going to contain a, a pointer to the next node. And um, let me make eye contact with the person that asked. It was you, wasn't it? Does that make sense? That's what it's going to look like. I haven't done it in C yet, but you understand where we're heading towards? Oh, it, how would loop at the end would be this final guy would then point back to the first one. Yeah, yeah. So once we've got a, a domino type thing here where it contains two components, a piece of data and a pointer to the next one, we could set up a long line of them to make like a snake, or we could make a loop so it goes back to the beginning. So what's this going to look like? Well, we're going to need this data structure. It's definitely a struct, isn't it? So let's write it. Uh, struct node squiggly brackets. And what's a node going to contain? It's going to contain a char star uh, oh uh, uh, Oh, now what, what don't I want to do here? See, I was going to do this. That's a string, isn't it? I mean, it's a pointer to a character. And presumably after that character, a sequence of other characters until you get to a zero, which marks the end of the string. But what's the pain of doing it this way? I have to malloc it to create it. I'm not setting any memory aside. This just creates name, which is a pointer to the char. I'm so lazy, I really want C to create things for me on the stack. So, because it's just nice, and I don't have to think about memory, and that's just nice. So, so I could have an array of characters here, if I knew the maximum name length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is everyone happy with that? Or we could say that all our children no longer get names in the future. A friend of mine had a child, and his boy was born on the year 2000. And he said, it's the next millennium. He's this really weird guy. It's the next millennium. He should have a name from the future. I'm going to call him Zoytek. <laughs> and he was serious. But his wife, who's really down to earth and nice, said, no. His name shall, his name shall be Carl. But very nearly, it was Zoytek. And that, so I think in the future, people will just have numbers for names. So let's just have our name being a number. Has anyone seen The Prisoner, that excellent TV show? Yes. yes. OK. It's an excellent TV show, which you should all watch. And he is, of course, number six. Yeah, the guy is called number six. Everyone just has a number. It's a very good show. OK. So we've got struct node, int name. It's a bit weird. And a pointer to the next node. <sighs> now, how's that going to work? What we need is um, a type that points to a node. Well, how about we try it like this? I could say, shh, shh, type def, I'm going to need more space to say this, and I'm going to want to do it above it. So let's combine both those things and do it on this point. I could say at the beginning, type def struct node star, uh, lowercase n, node pointer. And PTR is a standard way of writing point. It's a standard abbreviation, so we won't um, be terribly upset if you say PTR instead of pointer. So type, so node pointer is a pointer to a struct node. Does that make sense? So whenever you see the word node pointer from now on, what you really mean is pointer to struct node. And then underneath that, we'd write struct node is an int, which is a name, and a what here? Node pointer, which we'll call next, which points to the next node. And that's the end of our node struct. Instead of having a name, could it be child? Uh, <coughs> should it be a child and then the name is stored in the child uh, Yeah, I mean, this type should be child type. I guess I just typed def child type to int. But yes, thank you. That's right. Let's make it abstract. Thank you. Thank, let's make it abstract. Yes, thank you very much. That's right. You just want to be able to keep saying kill child rather than <laughs> kill, kill int. 
Um, but that's right. No, Stephen's exactly right. Let's make that abstract. We'll just say it's a child. And all we're doing is deferring to later on exactly thinking what type that is. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's whatever gets carried around in the list. It's sort of independent of the structure of the list. Okay, uh, so da, 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 da. and because we never wanted to say struct node in our code, let's type def this whole thing. Type def struct node blah blah blah. What are we going to call it? Node. Remember that's our convention that we try and make the, the name of the type the same as the name of the tag in the struct. And so now, from now on, I can just talk about nodes, and I really mean this struct, struct node, blah, blah, blah. Now, once we've got these two definitions in place, then um, if I wanted to uh, create the linked list, what would I say? I've got a node. I've got node pointer called current. I've got a node pointer called current. Node pointer is going to point to a node. Where is current currently pointing to? Nowhere. I want it to point to a node. I need to create a node. How am I going to do that? Current equals malloc. How many bytes am I going to need? Size of node. I uh, know because node is type def to be struct node. Yep. Yes, we prefer type defs and structs to be in the same statement. Uh, yes. Yeah. We prefer not to actually refer to structs as structs. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but you can break them into two. You could define the, stri the struct and then type def it afterwards, but. I prefer them together. I'm, I'm not going to hate you if you don't do it. But I really don't really want to see struct. I, I, I really don't really want. I really, really don't want to see struct floating around very much by itself because we're trying to actually type def it out. Now, once we've done a malloc, what should I do? I should check. Thank you very much. I should check that it worked. And our lazy way of doing that is assert current is not equal to no. Okay, now we've made our first node. Now, uh, who's the first child? Suppose the first child is number six. I want to put the first child in there, so how am I going to set the first child to be number six? What would I say? What am I going to say? To set, so what have I done? As we execute this code, it sets up a pointer called current, which is going to point to somewhere. At the moment, it's pointing randomly. Current equals malloc size of node. Okay, now current points to an area of memory that contains a child and a next. What values are in this random area of memory I just randomly got? Nothing. Rubbish. So child is rubbish at the moment, next is rubbish at the moment. I now actually want to make child number six. How can I make child number six? Assuming child is typed F to be int. Cur yeah, I've got a pointer to a struct, so I can use this notation. Current dot uh, child equals six. Who, all right, so now this contains six. The next, it's not pointing anywhere. How do I note that it's not pointing anywhere? It's got rubbish in there, but I want to say no, it's not pointing anywhere. It's the end of the list. If I wanted to, I, yeah, if it's the smallest loop in the world, I want it to point to itself. If this is a loop of size zero, oh, size one, so I'd want to say current next equals what's going to go in this field here? A pointer to itself. Do we have a pointer to this struct? Yeah. What's it called? Current. Current dot next equals current. That even a bit reads like I'm setting up a loop, doesn't it? Okay, so now we've set up the world's smallest loop. Well, the smallest loop is even smaller, I guess, but that's a loop that contains one element. Is that cool? Should we insert a child into the loop just so you can see how to do that? Just so you can see the C syntax for inserting someone. All right, what are we going to need? We're going to need a new node. Um, uh, where are we going to insert the child? After current, maybe? 
All right, if we're going to insert the child after current, you've got to be careful when you do operations like we're about to do now, because you'll be making new bits of memory, moving pointers around, and everyone's, the only way you can ever get to this struct is because a pointer is pointing to it. If you were to ever lose this pointer, that bit of memory is just gone forever. You just cut the string, it's a balloon, it flies away. So we've got to make sure in all our operations here that we never let go of bits of strings to balloon. And if we want to change one bit of string to another bit of string, let's make sure we tie the new bit of string on first, and then we're holding both bits of string before we cut that bit of string. Yeah, yeah? We always want something linked. So I'm going to set up a temporary bit of string to point to a struct just because, although we could do it without it, um, let's make it really obvious. So we'll have a pointer called temp. Let's say temp. So we're going to go uh, node pointer temp equals, and what am I going to get temp to point to? Maybe the new guy. Yeah, we'll make a new guy. So how do I make him point to the new guy? How do I create a new child? No, how do I create a new node? <laughs> new node. How do I make a new node? I'm going to have to malloc it. There's no other way of making it. So I'm going to go equals malloc size of node. All right now, we've got a new node that's been created. What's in here? Rubbish. What's in temp? A pointer to there. So this is the situation we've got at the moment. Now I want to make, what am I going to do? It's, oh, I better put a child in there first before I fool around with pointers. What's this child called? Seven. Child number seven. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, two. <laughs> if you, I just think if you gave your children numbers or something, they'd spend all their life trying to work out what they meant. You know. Why did I get 17 and he got four? You know? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> okay, so oh, not current. Uh, sorry, temp. Temp is a pointer to a struct. So if I want to talk, talk about one of the fields in the struct that it points to, what's the notation I need to use? Arrow. Child equals 42. All right? So now we've done all the easy bits. Now let's think, before we do anything now, I like drawing pictures before I do the next bit because I always get it wrong. So I draw pictures that look just like this when I'm writing programs involving nodes and pointers and things. I'm going to want to insert this into the loop. So I guess the first thing I'm going to do is get this guy to point to that guy. And then I'll get this guy to point to that guy. And that's OK, because I've got current and temp pointing to these guys. I'm not going to lose track of anyone. OK. So step one, so this continues up here. Suppose there's a linked list of blackboards. Step one is going to be, how am I going to set this to point to that? You tell me. What's the line of code I've got to type? Current next, this field here, current next, equals a pointer to this guy, which temp currently is. So we might as well just copy that pointer from temp. Okay, now we've got this situation, but this has still got rubbish in it. I want this guy to point to there. What do I have to do? Temp next equals current. Equals current next or equals current? Yeah, yeah. Oh, if we have more than one, then that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But let's just do it exactly like we've done it now. You're, you're one step ahead. That's right. You want to write a more generic question. Um, so this guy is currently pointing to this guy. So we've already changed current next. Now temp next. Temp next. We want to point to this guy. Current point copies to this guy, so we'll copy current into temp next. And now temp next will be appointed to him. Whew. Is that confusing? Yes. All right. Now, if you've done pointers before, you're thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's normal. I do that all the time. If you've never done pointers before, you're thinking, what? What? I hate pointers. But, but doing pointers is very, very simple. If you give everything good names to draw pictures and just do it carefully one step at a time. Now, we're going to be doing lots of pointers in our chutes this week. Um, just to give you some practice. Uh, yeah. 
look, I did want to play you a piece of music. Uh, and then we'll take a break. In fact, we can play this music during the break if you want. But it's important that everyone is respectfully quiet while this music's playing. So if you want to get up and move around, if you could sort of do it in a marching sort of way. And if you leave the room and come back in, if you could sort of bow when you come back in and then go and sit in your seat. I just want everyone to be very respectful while we're playing this music. No laughing or anything like that. Now, this piece of music is in WAV format. WAV... Shh, dot .wav, wave format, is a standard. What it is, is it's a document produced by someone that says, a WAV file shall contain this bit, and this bit, and this bit, and this bit. Who's ever played a WAV file on their computer? Well done, okay. Uh, it's like, uh, does it stand for something? It's not Windows something or something? It does stand for WAV, okay. It's an audio file. It, it's, the container it's in, the standard it uses is something called the uh, R... IFF format. It's a sub-branch of the RIFF format. There's a standard that tells you exactly how to encode data in this file. So someone makes an audio file. You make an audio file in WAV format. You produce it according to the standard. Yeah, you on your guitar or something and you write some software to encode that. You give it to you. You can play it on your player because your player also knows the standard and you know how to strip the information out that he's given you and play it back. Let's just have a quick look at that standard as an example of a standard in operation. Now, this isn't the standard. This is just someone trying to work, explain the standard to themselves. But I thought they explained it really well. WAV can hold, oh, sorry. WAV can hold lots of different formats. Um, but let's suppose it's encoding, it's holding uncompressed data in PCM format. A WAV file is just a container that can hold whatever data you want. So here's what a WAV file looks like. I just Googled WAV format to find this. Um, it's got an ID chunk at the top that has to contain RIF, which is sort of cool. Uh, and then it has to contain the chunk size. And the chunk size is, um, bizarrely enough, the size of the whole rest of the file. This whole thing is called a chunk. So this is the size of the whole rest of the file, excluding the chunk size and the chunk ID. It's just eight bytes less than the whole file. Eight bytes down, between eight and 14 bytes is something that encodes the format. Now, we're hoping the format is going to be um, PCM. Because uh, if it is, I can play it back. And if it isn't, I don't know how to. And uh, so PCM, I think, is format code number one or something. We'll find out in a sec. And then the file's broken into two other chunks called subchunks. This subchunk here, which is all one nice pretty colour, contains the format information, contains information about how the data is structured, and then the chunk under that contains the actual data itself. And all these fields can store stuff like the sample rate, the bit rate, the number of channels, what's the compression format, what's the byte rate we want to play it at, some byte alignment stuff, all sorts of crap is stored in here. And then down here, we just store how much data, the size of the chunk, Oh, an ID saying this is the actual data, how much data is in here, and then we store the actual data. So 44 bytes into a WAV file, if it's holding unencoded PCM data, uncompressed PCM data, uh, 44 bytes into it, you start getting all the data. Encoded into left and right channels. Um, uh, here's more description of what's going on. Here's a file, and if we go down 44 bytes, here's what we're starting to see. The, first of all, there's a keyword data that indicates it's the data format. It's just like a check thing to make sure it's right. And then... The, the size alignment thing, and then the data starts here, 8 bytes in, and you can see 2 bytes, because this is encoding a 16-bit audio file. 16 bits means each sample is using 16 bits of memory. How many bytes is 16 bits? 2 bytes. So here's the first sample on the left channel. Here's the first sample, the right channel. Here's the first sample, the left sample. The second sample, the left channel. Second sample, the right channel. It's in stereo. There's two channels encoded in there. So can you see this? If you take every um, second, third, then skip fourth, fifth, and then take sixth, seventh, and skip eighth, ninth, you could just extract the, the left channel, or you could go down the other way and extract the right. Okay. Does that all make sense to people? And we could even look at one of these files. Though unfortunately, my Mac isn't happy to talk to the projector today, so I can't show you. But I downloaded a file called the Binary Editor, which lets you, anyone can get them, they're all freeware. I've got one for the Mac, but there's lots of them for Windows, even more for Windows. You can open this file, the WAV file I'm about to show you, which I'll give you. You can actually open it in a binary editor, and you can view the chunks of data in there, and you can see the encodings that are just like they're supposed to be, and all sorts of stuff like that. So, all right. So, WAV format isn't particularly interesting because it's not encoded, but it is fairly universal for explaining stuff. Here's a link to it if you wanted to do it. But I wanted to sh give you an example of what a WAV format sounds like, so I'm going to play this. Beautiful music. So everyone is free to get up respectfully and move around during this beautiful music. I better make sure that I've got some volume somehow. Let's just hope this is going to work. Shh, 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 shh. 
Windows Media Player. What's that? Is that any good? Is there another? Do we have any choice at all? Uh, does Firefox doesn't? What about? Um, does this have a Quick Time Player or something? No, mate. All right, we're going to play with Windows Media Player, and I'm, just, I'm apologising in advance. Oh, it's turn on the lights on. Okay, so you guys can move around, but respectfully now, please. Do they pass or are they skipped over? Pass. 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 Okay, that's good. Pass. Because it didn't say that any 